words in a song like Hi guys, happy Tuesday, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining us from in the world today. We are so happy to have you back for another fabulous Power to Fly Chat and Learn event. I cannot wait to introduce you to our speaker and get started, but before we do, I just want to go over a couple of real quick housekeeping items for everybody, um, especially useful if you have never been to a Power to Fly event before, in which case, welcome, um, or maybe you haven't been with us for a while, so we'll give you kind of a refresher on how to get the most out of today's event. Now, one thing to know is that these events are all about you. Truthfully, I would not have a job if it were not for all of our amazing community, our talented fabulous professionals that, that work with us, that come see us. I would not have this job without for you. So if we want to do, uh, you know, kind of make the, the most out of today's uh, chat and learn session, a couple different ways you can do that. You can um, feel free to turn your cameras on if you'd like. Um, we always love seeing everybody's smiling, maskless faces safely. Um, but if you do want to do that, please don't feel like you have to be Instagram perfect. I think this is day four of dry shampoo. Um, you know, I've got my furry coworkers spread all around me. There's all kinds of stuff going on here. So if you are working from a non-traditional workspace, if you have child supervisors who are watching everything that you do, please understand we want to meet you where you are. You do not need to be perfectly quaffed to come join us. Just, you know, show up and we are glad to have you. Now, if you still want to participate, but you want to do it in a different way, you can also write any questions or comments you might have um, for our speaker today into the, the Zoom group chat. Uh, you'll be able to find that in your Zoom toolbar under chat. Now, if you have a question or a comment that you would like to raise, but you want to be kept anonymous, not a problem at all. All you have to do is send in, um, when you go to send your question or your comment in, you're going to pick my name, Meg Alexander, from the drop down instead of sending it to everyone. So I'm happy to do that, keep y'all anonymous for any reason, doesn't matter. Now, um, if you have any kind of other privacy concerns, totally understood. Um, just know that as long as you don't come off mute today, you will not show up on the live recording or the, the sorry, the recording or the live stream of today's session. So if you, you know, are, are you wanna join in, but you wanna make sure that, that you know, you're kind of uh, stay off, that is totally fine. You can still share your camera. It will not show up as long as you don't come off mute. Um, now, I, like I did say, today's session is being recorded. Now, what that means for all of you is that you get to kick back and enjoy. You don't have to take notes. You don't have to worry if you, um, you know, didn't quite catch the, the link or the resource or the tip that somebody said. You can always go back and rewatch this recording later. And in fact, everybody that registered is going to get an email in about one to two business days from Power to Fly. And it'll have a link to where you can rewatch this recording once it's posted on our website. Now, let's say Dr. Mary says something just like so unbelievably mind blowing. You cannot wait one to two business days to share this with somebody, you know, a coworker, a relative, a friend, any of it. Now you don't have to wait the one to two business days. You can always head over to our YouTube channel. I'm going to share the link with y'all in the chat thread in just a moment here, but you can go over to our YouTube channel. Um, the recordings are posted usually within about five to 15 minutes at the end of the live stream. And you can always go in there, share any of the links you want. You can search um, a whole ton of our, our archived videos, our past chats and past events are stored in that Power to Fly uh, you know, chat and learn account on YouTube. So you can go and go through a ton of our, our, past, uh, our past events, but you can also check those out on the website too. Our website has our full archive of all of our past event videos. Um, so absolutely free resources that we want to try and give to as many people as possible. So while you are here and you're learning with us today, please feel free if you would like to, you know, uh, take pictures, take video, um, share out with your social media and let everybody know that you are learning and growing with Power to Fly today. Um, again, these are free resources. We want to get them to as many people as possible. And so in that, you know, we would love to, you know, feel free to tag us. We would love to reshare or retweet whatever y'all are posting, um, anything we can do to get these resources in the hands of even more people. Um, now I did mention our, our Power to Fly YouTube. We are also at Power to Fly on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, so if you have any, you know, if you want to keep up with us on those various social channels, I recommend it. We share all kinds of great stuff. Um, we have daily blog posts that go up. There are Meet the Recruiter videos. Um, we share uh, fresh job um, uh, fresh uh, job descriptions that have just hit um, the Power to Fly job boards. So absolutely, I recommend that you, you follow us on those various, uh, various platforms um, to stay informed and get the most out of, out of Power to Fly. 
Now, I'm super excited to introduce you to our speaker today. Um, I was getting a chance to chat with her before today's chat started. I cannot wait to dig in. Um, now, in case you haven't heard of her, uh, Dr. Mary Hemphill is a leadership expert and coach. Uh, she's a K through 12 educator and administrator, author, as well as a motivational speaker. Now, um, Mary, Dr. Mary has over 15 years of professional experience as a teacher, administrator, state director, and university professor. And Mary understands the importance of fusing education, empowerment, and leadership together. Um, and doing that uh, as she works with learning and working communities and speaking to the audiences across the country. Now, Dr. Mary Hemphill is a, the CEO and founder of the Limitless Lady LLC, a company that helps individuals ignite the leader in themselves so that they can better serve their community, company, and personal career. Now, Dr. Hemphill is, I'm so, so happy to have her with us today. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience before we dive into questions? Just truly excited to be here, Meg, and really excited to put some resources in the hands of engaging leaders today. So thank you so much for that introduction. Heck yes. All right. Uh, and thank you, because I just get handed these lovely bios. So absolutely awesome work on behalf of my uh, my prep squad, Paloma and Erica. Fabulous. Kicking it, like truly crushing it. Um, all right. Last thing we're going to talk about before we dive into questions today are some of the key takeaways. Now, uh, what you're seeing in front of you are three areas that we wanted to, to make sure that we touched on today. And we identified these um, both via conversations with Dr. Mary prior to today's session, but also by looking at the questions that you all submitted when you registered. Now, all of that to say, what you're seeing on the screen is what we're gonna try and cover. But if you took time out of your day to be here and, and spend time with us live for the recording today, we want to make that, you know, we want to make sure that you get rewarded for that. So if you have a question and want to ask it, please feel free. Know that if you are here live, you have the power to drive today's conversation. So if, um, you know, if Dr. Mary starts talking about something and you want to dive in deeper, let us know in that chat. Let me know in a DM. Doesn't matter. Let us know. Um, if you submitted a question and you're not sure if we're going to get to it or not today, let us know. I can't make sure that we, uh, you know, I can't make sure that I give you guys answers if you don't tell me what you want to know. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some ways to identify areas of self-care and self-awareness in your own life. We're going to explore some blocks to self-care. Obviously, a lot of us know that there are always going to be hurdles, um, and as well as looking at blocks in different areas of our lives to help set goals and improve ourselves. And then we're going to discuss how you can develop strategies for engaging your employees, especially those affected by mental health issues, trauma, or a lack of positive self-care strategies. So a lot of ground we're going to cover today. I cannot, cannot wait. Um, but I will, as always, be uh, checking out the, the chat um, and ready to pull in any questions that y'all have. So feel free, send questions. Let us know how you're, how you're feeling. Like, you know, do you agree with what we're talking about? Do you have a different lived experience? Have you tried something, you know, different that worked in relation to a problem that somebody else wrote in about? Um, please, please feel free. Let us know. We would love to hear from you. Yes. Um, all right. So Dr. Mary, let's kick off here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can spotlight us. Um, let's kick off with a question that we got in a lot of different, uh, different ways. I want to know if you can help us explain the difference between self-care and self-awareness. Absolutely. And this is a question that I get all the time. And I actually love how you prefaced it with today being a really interactive conversation. So if you do have other definitions or analogies, please feel free to hop into uh, the chat and be able to share. But when we think about self-care, and I think self-care has sort of elevated itself as one of those buzzwords when it comes to engaging leaders in the 21st century. However, when we approach self-care, what we're talking about is the practice of taking an active role in protecting your own well-being and your own happiness. So it's those activities that you engage in. It's those extracurricular spaces and places that you curate for yourself to say, you know what? I know I'm happy when I take time to make sure that my physical well-being looks good. I go and I get my mani pedis. I go and get my waxes. I Maybe I go to the theater. Maybe I go to a live show. And what we know is that COVID has really come in and said, okay, self-care is going to have to look a little different because we don't have access to those. Self-care is the active role in protecting, but self-awareness is when you realize that something's not in alignment with your happiness or your well-being. And self-awareness is that next step to say, you know what? I've been sadder than normal lately. Why is that? 
Is it because of a place? Is it because of food? Is it because of social media? Is it because of the images that I'm putting in front of me? So I always look at self-care as the doing, and I look at self and I look at self-awareness as the flexors or the opportunities I have to make adjustments to ensure that that self-care is what I need now. And what we've seen over the past two and a half years is that people are becoming more self-aware than ever. Why? Because of mental health and the increases and in upticks when we see depression, when we see those types of frustration with the changing amounts of work. So people are really starting to say, you know what, I'm not in alignment with my happiness and my well-being. So I'm making the necessary changes. Hence the great resignation with over 4 million people walking away from their jobs. That's self-awareness when you realize there's no alignment. Yes. Oh, I'm I, guys, I got to tell you, this is going to be a very good chat. I, I've already got goosebumps. I'm really, really excited to keep going. We're only on the first question. Um, just something that occurred to me while I was listening to you, and I'd, I'd love to get your opinion on this. Yes. Early, early, early on in the pandemic, I I mean, I was going through a whole bunch of stuff and I'm sure everybody else was. But one of the things that really struck me was how quickly people kind of switched the narrative from, I'm, you know, I'm worried, I'm scared, we're staying at home, this is, you know, staying at home, this is what we can do for people. And it's, it shifted so quickly to like, not boredom necessarily, but like, mm -hmm. I've got cabin mm -hmm. fever, I've got to get out of my house. And yes. as I was talking about this with a bunch of my friends and mental health is oh, like, it's like the third most common thing we talk about, which is like yes. how I know they're my people. But yeah. like, we would, as we were talking about it, it was like, well, no wonder nobody's doing this because you suddenly have way less distractions around you yes. and places to go and things to do that would, would kind of muddy the waters a bit of yes. trying to figure out like what's happening. Plus you're kind of forced to like be quiet with yourself. And that is there hard y'all. That is that uncomfortable. Is. And so like so many people got thrown into it. So now we do have people taking more note of things like their mental health, even outside of the people that were, you know, thinking about these things prior to the pandemic or even prior so, to the last year. So absolutely. for you, like, do you see this, like, do you see this trend and do you think that it's going to then crest and maybe wane again as we like, as we keep moving towards normal, or do you think yes. this is going to spark something that'll carry on longer? I definitely think this is going to spark something that's going to carry on lo longer, particularly when, when I hear conversations and I devour podcasts and literature around empowering the future of work and what I'm seeing across the board from everything from the CEO of Microsoft to small startup and tech companies and solopreneurs, people are baking in mental health into this work-life balance. So you have to remember, like you just said it so perfectly. We went from wanting to work from home to living at work. So think about the time that we have taken out traditional modes of the commute, going to the water cooler, getting my morning coffee and stopping by everybody's cubicle to ask for that. All of that has been baked back into our day. And I like to call it when I work with leaders, exploring your inner territory. Leaders have gotten inside themselves now more than ever without the, okay, I'm going to pop into the office, without the sounds of the fax machines or all of those types of things that take us away from that work. And people have had to incubate in themselves. I have had so many conversations with leaders. I had a lady, she's a CEO of a multi-million dollar corporation. And she said, Dr. Mary, she said, this is the most time I have spent with my significant other in 25 years of marriage. I had to relearn him. I had to relearn ourselves. We had to relearn what our relationship looks like. Same conversation as people are spending more time with their children. One lady, she said that she was having trouble making the distinction between work and home working and sending emails at 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. So we came up with a schedule where at five o'clock she gets in her car and she drives around the neighborhood so that physically and physiologically it's signaling the end of the workday. And then she comes home and gets into her role as a significant other, a mom, a sister, a daughter. So all of these shifts are changing. And I think those leaders who have been successful and have led through this disruption are really starting to say, we can't just invite people back. We can't just recruit people. Now employees have to have some level of mental security, some level of well-being, and we have to start the conversation and not say that it's our employees' responsibility. So I absolutely think this is going to last the test of time. Uh, I, I I cannot tell you how strongly I hope you're right, because I mean, it's, it's honestly been such a cool shift to see because it's like, well, yeah, if you, if you handle this area of like, of, yes. of you know, th something that impacts literally everyone, yes, you're, you're opening up so many other opportunities for yourself, so many other um, options, but
but also you're making your own job easier, right? Like yes. if you're managing people and you are thinking, you know, in terms of their mental health, even if they're mm-hmm. not, mm-hmm. you kind of have a little bit of a crystal ball, a little bit of an edge on people that you might not have had before, right? Right, exactly. And Meg, to that point to one of the things that we drive home to with Limitless is that we are human beings and not human doings. So even in the introduction, one thing I always encourage leaders or, or supervisors and leaders to do is to really think about thinking about the introduction. So the introduction you gave me as a leadership coach, an author, a motivational speaker, all of those are wonderful, but that's what I do. The connections come in if I pivot and I say as a human being, I'm a sister, I'm a daughter, I'm a fur baby mom, I absolutely love Pilates and physical health and wellness, all those types of things. You're going to connect more with the being of who I am versus the doing. And when we find those connections, just that, making connections across the boardroom table or making connections in your office, that is what we talk about when we talk about self-awareness. It's how do I really see people and bring people in and connect with them, not on their differences, but actually on what connects us and makes us more alike. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. So you had said something when we, we touched on the first question and I want to like kind of bring it into our second question here, but you had talked about, you know, the difference between the two, like between self-care and self-awareness and the Mm -hmm. idea that that self-care is something that is done to, for maintenance, right? It's done to like kind of keep the engine running, keep everything moving. Yes. Do you have any words for anybody who like some of us have been in therapy for multiple years and still to like, did not re- like fully, fully like kind of re- like realize that difference to ourselves until like, for me, it was like two months ago. It was that idea of like, oh no, this isn't the stuff I do to treat myself. This mm-hmm. is the stuff I do to recharge the batteries that I use doing yes. stuff like this. And Absolutely. it was like frustrating and angering of like, how did I not like think about this? Cause I get to sit on these chats all the time and it's wonderful. Right, exactly. So this is what I'll say. First of all, self-care, it comes in waves. It is not linear. So the adjustments that are happening in the external world are absolutely impacting your internal self-care and your internal self-awareness. So one of the things I always like to do when I have conversations like this is have a funeral for the term new normal because I've heard it a million times. So I'm going to give the eulogy for new normal. <laughs> new normal doesn't exist because it's it's really the now normal because I can log on to the news. I can open an email and something, some piece of information is going to shift how I see myself. But the goal is that I'm looking at it in three parts. My mental self-care and self-awareness, my physical self-care and self-awareness, and my emotional self-care and self-awareness are the three pieces that work together. I can go out here and do a jog every day, 30 minutes every single day, and my body's going to look good and it's going to feel good. But if mentally I'm not able to pull myself out of the doldrums of sadness, all I did was exercise my physical muscles. Now I need to go somewhere and sit and journal and meditate and like figure out where my stuff is. Maybe that's I connect with a licensed professional or therapist. Maybe I go to my circle of trust. And then that has absolutely nothing to do with our emotional self-care. And people sort of confuse the two because there's tools and there's strategies when it comes to that mental piece. But emotionally, we have victimized emotions for so many years, particularly when it comes to diversity. We're human beings. We have all the emotions. It's when people operate on the continuum of emotions where there becomes a problem. There's absolutely nothing wrong with Christian or Christelle or Erica getting upset, but when they operate on the continuum of anger management, it makes it hard for people to access them, makes it hard for teams to work with them. So I think when we really look every day at those three parts and say physically, emotionally, and mentally, where am I on a scale of one to five? And I just do, when I wake up, I just do a little check. Some days I'm like, oh, worked out at 4 a.m. Boom, got it. I'm a little frustrated about that project yesterday, but emotionally I'm okay. You have to take score and you have to calculate the score of where you're at daily just because we're in a 24-hour news cycle. Yes, last week when the tragedies happened, everyone was in a slump. So you also have to look at the collective because you as a leader, when you know where you're at, you're better able to lead teams and not ignore what I call the pink elephant in the room so that you can make those adjustments for yourself and for your team members. 
I love, I love what you're saying about having that check-in daily because you're right. I mean, there are, uh, I mean, it's, it's been going on forever, right? There's always yes. a, a very fast news cycle. There's always something yes. else that is horrible going on in the world that, you know, really like in a lot of ways, I don't know if you're like me, like feels like you, you have to pay attention. You, at, at minimum, I have to bear witness, right? Yes. This is happening while I'm alive on the planet. Yeah. And I, it's one of those things that I think you're right. It takes, it takes that, that ability to kind of keep checking with yourself and realize that I don't think it's a uniquely American thing, but we absolutely have this culture of perseverance, right? Like yes. you, the only way out is through and you'll get through this and just, you know, rub some dirt on it, keep going, tough it out. And right. that is a skill and it's a great one to have, but I feel like we've, we've kind of internalized it to be the default, you know? Yes. Like absolutely. nothing can bother you. So you can't check in because you're already in the, nope, nothing can bother me kind of mindset. Yeah. Right. Right. Absolutely. And I think to, to bridge that, and I always like, I'm big on strategy. As we recognize this, the analogy that I use is everyone here today, think about where you were when you found out about 9-11. Then think about the feelings that started to come up. Like we were overwhelmed emotionally with that tragedy and we watched it play out on the world scene. Now I want you to go back to the past two, almost three years and think about everything that we've watched play out. And if you were to compare your reaction to 9-11 in 2001 to everything that's been happening in 2021, 2022, the response is not the same. So why? Because if we were to take in the fullness of what's happening there, we would probably implode as human beings. We can't carry that. That's compassion fatigue. Our compassion fatigue as a people was at an all-time high in 2001. And I would yet to say that it's almost dismal, if not, if, if making its way to being extinct in 2021, 2022, because we can't stop to take in the fullness of all these tragedies. So you have to have a good self-care, self-awareness plan in place. Because research tells us that the average human experiences 2.5 traumatic events in their lifetime. But the research says that over the past two years, that the average human will experience 10.5 traumatic events in a quarter. So that's hard to process. And without self-care and without self-awareness, how do we always bring ourselves back to ground zero? Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about this, I want to make sure we highlight it. Um, when we're talking about trauma, right? I feel like a lot mm -hmm. of people think in terms of very large or very, very huge impactful events, right? And so right. they think like, well, I've never seen anyone die or I've never you know, been in an abusive relationship. And it's like, no, 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 no. Trauma is not limited to those things, right? Right, like, right. We're thinking in terms of the trauma that we need to recharge from. Like, can you give me some examples that people do, do not think are trauma, but absolutely like deserves a check-in, deserves Absolutely. a like, step back and see how you feel Absolutely. about this. That's intense. Exactly. So when we think about this idea of trauma and I think about being a conscious consumer, it's absolutely what you see in your eye gate. It's what you take in in your ear gate. And it's also the things that you repeat with your mouth gate. So I always think about the senses because trauma can happen with all of those. You can receive a text that maybe someone passed on your team that you did not know, but perhaps it shifted job responsibilities. It shifted the conversation. We all often think that trauma has to happen because someone directly that we knew and had a relationship with passed. But we have watched the mourning of other people who have lost loved ones. That's an example of trauma. We've also watched triggers play out for people. And I don't just mean the everyday person. I mean celebrities. I mean those in politics, all of those things. We watch these triggers play out too. So even though when we watch C-SPAN, yes, we may be going for information, but when we see world leaders who step outside themselves to either for a specific cause or those celebrities or thought leaders, that is also trauma. Trauma can also be a life shift. That doesn't necessarily end in the demise of an individual, but in the demise of the relationship. So many people, I'm going to mention again, the individual who told me I've never spent as much time with my significant other. The grief comes because the idea that she had for what a relationship looked like didn't happen anymore during quarantine. So when dreams die, that's trauma. 
because then you collectively have to go do the work with your significant other to figure out what that new relationship looks like. And it doesn't just have to be romantic because a lot of people have experienced trauma with their children as they have been working at home. And for parents to sit and say, I don't know how to help you read. I don't know how to help you do math problems. That's trauma. Also, what we're seeing now is that because everybody has these two things or they have the opportunity to be able to comment on everything and not attach a face or a profile picture to it, there's also the trauma of actually showing up on the world scene. And I'm not just talking about Facebook or Instagram or TikTok because LinkedIn is a huge professional space to do that. But now we're starting to see those opinions. So trauma can happen on the Richter scale, like you said, from very minimal to very severe. But when we think about all of those compounded triggers, changes, and shifts and pivots that we've had to go through collectively, that makes for a traumatic experience. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you so much for, for kind of dialing that out. Because I feel like you're right. There are a lot of people that don't, they're like, oh, no, I've been through trauma. I'm fine. Ev- everyone's been through trauma. Literally yes. everybody. You've probably been so through we- one in the last year, minimum. And you, even if you don't realize it, it's, it's going to affect you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I think to, to that point, one of the things I always encourage leaders to do is to become a conscious consumer. And when I say a conscious consumer, I don't just mean the social media. I mean, it is absolutely about what you post, what you retweet, what you share. And one of the best ways to be able to do that just with, just with tech, because that's the space that we live in, is to do a tech audit. You should have double the amount of motivation, inspiration, and education as you do personal accounts where you know it may be triggering something. So even if it's not adding to your body of knowledge, I say this all the time, I absolutely love my third grade teacher, but I had to unfriend her because her kitten had literally litters all the time. So all I was seeing was cats, cats, cats. That's not adding to my body of knowledge. I also had to unfollow, delete, block, and mute other individuals because when I was logging off, I felt just a heaviness. That's not the intended purpose of social media. So for leaders, for self-care, one good question to ask yourself is, what's your true tech north? By that, I mean, why do you go online? What is it that you want to accomplish? And then ensure that your followers and the information that you're posting and writing about align with the kind of leader that you want to be. Because if not, eradicate the noise. Being a conscious consumer also is about food. What we intake absolutely measures our outtake and the type of leader we want to be. So if you want to be healthy, happy, and whole, you know that you can't eat the steak and the donuts and drink the beer and not work out. You absolutely know that you, and even I see Christina laughing like strawberry shortcake. I'm like, I know I can't do two of these and not go run in the morning, right? So it's a balance. That's the self-awareness. The shortcake is going to make me happy in the temporary realm, but long lasting. I also want to model the type of leader who understands balance. It's also about people. As a leader and engaging leader right now, you have to understand that who you surround yourself with is the type of leader you're going to become. You're the sum of their opinions, their assumptions, and their perspectives. So if someone's not your cheerleader, someone's not your advocate, if someone's not pouring into you, it is your life and you need to hire and fire accordingly. That's the self-awareness and the shifts that can be made to be a conscious consumer in this age. Yeah. Okay. So when we're talking about this this, um, you know, developing that sense of self-awareness, right? Mm-hmm. And like you said, you know, to reiterate for anybody that might have missed it, self-awareness is going to be more about like recognizing moments that that kind of highlight that, that something's mm-hmm. kind of off versus self-care being the stuff that happens to repair what's going on yes. or whatever you're identifying for self-awareness. Yes. If people think that they're starting from a baseline of zero, what are there processes to follow to help help increase that self-awareness in ourselves? Absolutely. So the two things I say for for beginners, so for starting at ground zero, is to take a look at your calendar. And I know it sounds crazy, but a time audit is going to tell you what you value because you spend time on the things you value and what you value, your money also follows. So one thing I do with leaders is I say, pull up your calendar, whether it's your personal or professional, have you scheduled you? Because you schedule the hair appointments. You schedule the board meetings, but did you schedule yourself working out? 
Did you put a reminder on it the same way you did to make sure that you were up and ready and dressed, even if it was business on the top, party on the bottom for that Zoom meeting? You still made preparation for it. So when leaders value themselves, you're going to see that they're putting that opportunity to, for thinking time, for meditation, for going for a jog, for making sure that they're connecting with friends. So that's the first thing is to do the time audit. And then there's three questions. And I always say for these questions, these aren't questions that you ask as you're passing by. These are questions that you take with yourself. And I do what I call a self-care sabbatical. And I do it once or twice every single year. But I take time, whether it's a staycation or whether I go away, and I answer these three questions. What kind of leader do I want to be in my personal and professional life? And I get very granular and very specific. I almost put myself as a fly on the wall and I answer that question. What do I want to hear others saying about me? What spaces do I want to dominate? Where do I want to learn more? And what does that mean for me and my personal and my professional relationships? The second question, because this is an area that sort of lives between self-care and self-awareness, is self-regulation. When your car says, I need an oil change, you don't keep driving three, five, 10,000 miles. You find the nearest spot to go get an oil change. But then when our bodies or when situations or relationships say, this relationship is not that healthy, this job is draining you, this person is not that good for you, we still think, keep thinking we're going to chug, 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 chug. And before you know it, you're out. So self-regulation, that question is, how do I identify and manage potential distractions to my success? And I want to go back. The distraction can be social media. It could be food. It could be a person. It could be anything. But what do you do with that distraction? Do you turn the dial up on it and keep on going? Or do you turn the dial down and say, I'm going to eradicate it because it's not aligned with the vision that I want to be? And then that last question, I think, is really important when we think about just empathy and we think about the idea that self-care can't happen unless we understand how other people are perceiving us, is what are some of my personal beliefs and biases that are interfering with my growth? This is important because in the world that we live in, how you think what you assume, your perspectives, your experiences, they impact your team, they impact your home, they impact your community. And when you know, oh, I have a particular bias in this area, or I have a particular preference in this area, and it is making this relationship hard, or it's making this partnership hard, that's when you say, okay, I can either go learn more about it, I can surround myself with people who are experts in it so I can learn and engage, or I can go start listening to a TED Talk or find a podcast and educate myself. Because it's not just enough to say, you know what, I have a real big bias in this area. Again, self-awareness, what are you going to do about it? And bring yourself back into alignment with your happiness and your well-being. Yeah, that, that, the, the getting the shift from, hey, something's not right to I'm going to do something about it. Yes. obviously way easier said than done, but yes, like you have to, uh, identifying the issue is not enough, right? Like if you've exactly. identified it, that's great. But like, if you don't do anything else, then what's, what's the point of having identified it? Exactly. Exactly. And it's those steps. And that's why I always say the time audit is important because once you start scheduling your self-care, you're going to start to see a difference. And once you start to value that and put a reminder on it, the same way you would do anything else, that's accountability. And share it with your circle of trust. Ask them to ask you, hey, did you take the time today? Because sometimes it's not just enough for us to know it. You have to engage partnership. I heard a great quote the other day. It said, the CEO of the future is a team. So nobody is going to go it alone moving forward. And your personal and your professional team are the number one indicators of success moving forward. It's the people. It's not the place. It's the people. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, and I, I'm thinking back to like ways that I've done this and I have done this poorly for myself in the past, <clears throat> but one of the best things I ever did and like started from the jump was like, when I scheduled out my therapy appointments, I blocked out time on my work calendar and I was like, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm I mean, I'm a very transparent person, but like, I was like, yeah, this is my time. I'm going, I'm doing therapy. And I built it. I mean, especially even in the realm of telehealth, I built in that, like, 
uh, commute to and from your therapist office. So you can kind yes. of get yourself in the mindset of like, okay, what yeah. do you want to talk to her about today? And then like have that 15, 20, 30 minutes on the back end to be like, that was a lot. And maybe sometimes you leave and you're all puffy and it's been a big, like emotional mm-hmm. day. Mm-hmm. And other times you mm-hmm. leave and you're like, yeah, this is great. But either exactly. way you have that buffer built in. And the, the second I started doing that, mm-hmm. People, not only did people absolutely respect it, I never heard from anyone during that therapy mm-hmm. window, but like, I also then got people reaching out to me asking like, you know, how did you find a therapist? And like, what are you finding that yes. this does for you? And like, yes. so if you're going to try, if you're in a leadership position, modeling that behavior is going to be incredibly impactful for your org, even if it only extends to you, even if all you're absolutely. doing is protecting your space. Absolutely. And Meg, like hearing you say that is so amazing because I'm imagining if leaders were able, you said the keyword model, because when you model it, you give people permission to do the same. And sometimes people are just looking for permission. So, and then when they hear you doing it and then they see you backing it up with your actions, I was giving you snaps. I was like, yes, Meg. Perfect. Yes. All right. We're getting a very good question in from Christina. Okay. Uh, Christina wants to know, how do you make sure that people around you respect those steps that you're trying to take, especially mm. if they don't or will not buy in, you know, Absolutely. huge, huge in, an important distinction there too, because you're right. Like, you know, it's one thing to be doing this yourself, but then you have to do this out in the world and it's not just yeah. you and your bubble, right? Absolutely. So one of the big things that we do with Limitless is create a limit plan and the I in limit is to invite stakeholders. We oftentimes think that in business, we have to ensure that this stakeholder understands our business goals. We invite them to the table. We say, what can you bring to the table specifically? Because what we know is that every stakeholder brings something different. But in our personal lives, we sort of think that it is relationship by proxy. Like, because she's my sister, guess I need to engage her. Because he's my husband, I guess I need to engage her. Because they're my partner, I need to engage them. But specifically, you have to invite stakeholders into your vision. So what it would look like is saying, Meg, hey, Meg, could we grab coffee maybe 30 minutes? Or if we don't have time, could we maybe hop on Zoom? One of the things I want to talk to you about is I'm really thinking about what my personal and professional leadership persona looks like. And one thing that you have done for me my whole entire life, you've always held my feet to the fire. You didn't tell me what I needed to hear, or you always told me what I needed to hear, even though I didn't want to hear it, but you was just, you just had eyes on those things that I needed to do to get better. Is there any way that I could share my vision with you? And perhaps you just be my constructive critic. And when I come to you, maybe I know you're busy, but maybe we could find time on the calendar, maybe two or three times a year and just really help hold me accountable and tell me the things that maybe my team members might not tell me or my partner doesn't tell me because they're so close to me and to be able to say those things. Do you see how I gave you a role, elevated what it is that you already do well? So I'm not adding, I'm not asking you to be my critic and my cheerleader and my advocate and the person I vent to. But you understand that I value what you do for me already. And then here's the other thing. You can disagree. You can say, I don't have the bandwidth to do that. Mary, I just got a promotion, just got married, just had a baby. I don't have the time to be able to do that. But then I honor your boundary. That is healthy. When you recognize that somebody in your life does something, you could do this with your team. You can say, hey, Susan, you show up on time all the time for Zooming. You log on 10 minutes before. Could you be responsible for setting up our agenda? You just do that so well and perhaps doing a recap. She's there already. She does that already. So empower her because then your self-care is delegated that. I don't have to worry about the agenda. Susan does it well. So I'm putting her as the expert in that. When you invite people specifically to partner with you in your vision, don't just say, here's my big vision. Tell me what's wrong with it. Tell me what I need to do. Be granular about the relationships you already have and cultivate those relationships because if they're a naysayer or if they don't want to be a part of it, guess what they can never say now? Well, you didn't tell me. Well, you didn't ask me because now you have been very democratic and really saying, this is what I need for you to do. And I appreciate that you can't do it and telling me why. And I st- that doesn't mess up our relationship or our partnership in business. I'm, I'm loving what you're talking about, about kind of like not only identifying who, who you want to bring into that new circle, but mm-hmm. something that took me an embarrassing a long time to realize is, and I think this especially applies to leaders because you're always mm-hmm. trying to think in terms of the team, right? Yes. 
other people don't need to be satisfied with what you're doing. Not everybody needs to be on board with what you're doing for you to be successful. Yes. And it has taken, I'm sure I'm not the only one. It has taken me an embarrassingly long time to be like, oh, okay. So you don't, you don't get what I'm talking about. And that's fine. I don't need to waste my energy and waste my time. Like, you know, digging deep to try and explain it to you in a way that you will get, you know, and there will be people in your life you have to do that with. Cause like, you know, like if my husband wasn't on board with, you know, my, my mental health needs or something, then yeah, you got to have a lot of conversations about this and try and figure out a way to get what you, you need out of a relationship that really is not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. But like when it comes to your coworkers, when it comes to your family members, when it, like you, if you know that what you're doing is right for you, you don't need Absolutely. that buy-in. And it's okay for them to disagree. I love that. I, and I think what you just said is just that permission that I was talking about. And you have to give yourself permission to let other people off the hook. Because when you start doing this work, it's deep work. I said exploring your inner territory. You're going to get in there and there's going to be things. And you're going to be like, ooh, I'm starting to feel things, right? But what is going to happen to you is you start to communicate that with other people you're holding a mirror, maybe up to things they haven't dealt with. And so one of the things I tell my limitless leaders all the time is it's not your responsibility to babysit other people's insecurities. Because what happens when you babysit them? You take them, you hold them close, you take care of them until that person decides to come pick them back up. And we just are carrying too much as human beings right now. Yes. Yes. Oh my goodness. All right. So we only have uh, about 15 minutes left. It, it always okay. goes way too quickly. So if y'all have questions that you want to get in, please, please feel free to ask them. Um, now, one of the things I wanted to touch on, cause you had said something about, you know, delegating to, I think her name was Maria or something, delegating the, you know, the mini, the meeting notes or the meeting agenda and how mm-hmm. that could be a form of self-care. How can we address or like kind of t- sit back and look and see if the self-care techniques that you're using are effective? Like I used to think that like painting my nails was self-care. Turns out I'm a pretty big perfectionist and it's not actually as fun for me as I thought it was. It was fun when like we did it as a group, like my girlfriends would come over and I'd do their nails and it was social, right? Uh-huh. That part was the self-care, but I just assumed, well, yeah, I'll do my nails. It'll be self-care. No, no, it's not actually helping me. It makes me like, you know, kind of ticked off for the afternoon and then I have to sit and not touch anything. And yeah. So yes. like, how, how do we sit back and see like, is this self-care actually working the way we want it to? Absolutely. So that's a good question. One of the things I think it goes back to that question in terms of how you want to show up. So one thing that I do is I make sure that I look at my short and my long-term goals and short-term goals are things like, I want to get this certification. I just want to start cultivating a better workplace culture. Those long-term goals are those opportunities where ephemerally and internally, we're shifting our personality a little bit. I want to be kinder. I want to be more empathetic. So what you can start to do is start to do measuring sticks. One thing that I love to do is ask my circle of trust, how are you experiencing me? And my circle of trust has everything from my cheerleader, my advocate. I have some of my employees, people in my personal life. They're going to tell you because you walk with them in different ways. And if you get responses that are not aligned with your short and long-term goals, that's where you need to make some shifts. So you use the example of going and getting your nails done. Well, going and getting your nails done was something that you thought, again, it's one of those traditional self-care items, but look at all of the pieces and subsets that go into that. Does it take you out of alignment with your happiness and well-being more than it keeps you in alignment with your well-being? Because you're sitting, then what happens? Your anxiety goes up because you're like, what could I be doing in this 15 minutes, right? Or if you smudge something and you're like a recovering perfectionist like me, you think, oh my gosh, now I got to go redo it. So those are the pieces. So what I decided to do, and Meg, you're not the only one. I said, I can't, I can't do my nails, but I'm going to work hard so that I can schedule a professional to be able to do that. And then maybe I can relax during that time. What does that do? That increases my endorphins. It makes me less anxious, more happy, more in alignment with my well-being. And I just got an hour on my calendar that I don't have to think about this process. And I'm giving back to small business. One of my big things is to give back to small businesses during this time. So I try not to go to the chain salons. I try to find local artists who can do wonderful things. 
I take it a step further. If they're just starting their business, how can I market this? Can I take a picture and tag you and hashtag you? That's part of the leader I want to be is to help people grow and to help people gain that traction. So it's deeper thinking about alignment, asking the questions and saying, how are you experiencing me? Taking that data point and marrying it with your vision. Then when your vision is saying, not aligned here, then make those necessary changes and take it back to the goal. What's your goal for how you want to show up as a human being in this experience that we're having? Oh, I, there's so much of what you're saying. That's truly just like echoing in my head, that idea of like, how are you experiencing me? That's huge. That's absolutely huge. You'd said something earlier too, that reminded me of like this idea of, you know, I live with bipolar disorder. So breaking things down into mental, emotional, physical yes. are huge because like my, my mood for the day is not my, is not my, like, like my energy level. It's they're completely different. So I had to kind of step back and start thinking of these and like breaking them down like that. But I think that it's really important for people to realize that like when you're, when you're looking at and you're reassessing these, these self-care things, Mm-hmm. like I I've had stuff like, like, I love to go outside. I love to garden. I love like, cause, and honestly, 90% of it is being outdoors and vitamin D. Right. So yeah. if I, if it's too hot for me to go out in the, out in the backyard and actually do something, then what does my body need and how can yeah. I get it a better way? So like yeah. maybe I go outside and I don't do anything in the backyard. I sit in the shade. I fill up the puppy pool. I, I sit in and like, just enjoy the breeze. Yes. But like, once I started doing that, it really surprised me how amazing it was because like, I don't do things just because they're fun. I try and make things fun for me, but I don't do Uh things just because they feel good. So Mm. like making that shift of like, okay, but it's the same thing. It's basically the same thing. I'm just making that tweak to get me what I actually need right now. When sitting outside in the sun in 90 degree weather is not necessarily going to really. Exactly. exactly. But how self-aware that conversation is with yourself. And I think that we sort of take that for granted is the fact that space is a resource. So outside is a reason when people say they need to get grounded, put your feet on the ground. It literally just energizes you or feeling that fresh air, or even your brick and mortar. People comment a lot on my background, but this is my living, breathing vision board for myself. Why? Because when working from home, you're going to spend so much time here. Use your space to inspire you and be intentional. So I love that you said, I'm not just doing it because it's fun. I'm doing it because it's intentionally like, I need some vitamin D. It it absolutely matters. So that self-awareness and those conversations are critical. Love that, Meg. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a lot of work and my therapist is doing all of the heavy lifting. So there you go. Oh. oh man, I'm telling you, but I, I, I totally agree with you, you know, having yourself kind of surrounded by the things that really pump you up. I'd never yes. gotten to like have my own office before. So now I have like, I'm lucky and resourced enough that like, I have a room in my house. There's an entire mural on the wall. Y'all can't see that. It talks about dismantle, abolish, crush, destroy, eradicate the patriarchy. And I see that every single time I sit down in this chair, every single time I get to record an invite video or talk to all of you or meet up with amazing people like Dr. Mary. And it pumps me up, y'all, because the patriarchy is just not bad for women. Patriarchy is bad for everyone. And so that is the thing that like, <sighs> that's what we're doing today. That's what I, I get to do. It. I love that. Babe. It pumps me up. Is it silly? Yes. hundred percent. Yeah, it works. Absolutely. And that, that is so like, you, that's your self-care and self-awareness plan lived out. Yeah. That's engagement. So I love that you shared that. Thank you. Um, all right. We have about 10 minutes left. I want to make sure we leave some time to talk about resources, but before we yes. do, I want to talk about blockers. So mm. how, can you tell us um, a little bit about how you identified some blockers in your life or in, you know, in the lives of people that you're coaching? Um, yes. how, how do you identify them from the start? Cause I feel like a lot of people maybe don't even recognize blockers as blockers. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I do is called the one minute meeting campaign. And so what that'll look like, for instance, I could take Christina and I would say, Christina, what do you think that your self-care is saying to the world? Because we're all a brand. If I say Nike, you're going to think, just do it. If I think Burger King, you're like, have it your way. When you think of these top brands, there's things that come, when I say Burger King, you could think of that flame burger and what it, what it tastes like, all of that experience. 
when Christina comes in the room, Christina has a brand. How she speaks to people, how she talks, how she carries herself. So I ask people, give me in one minute, what's your campaign for self-care? Because what you think you're projecting to people might not be what they're receiving. Do you take the time to smile? And when you ask people how they're doing, do you plant your feet and wait for an answer? Or do you just keep on chugging down to your office? People and, and maybe miss the moment that somebody said, I'm not okay. But when I stop and do that, and in my mobile campaign, maybe I'm saying, I really care about people. Well, the evidence is that I ask everybody on my team how they're doing, and I'm still waiting for the answer. A lot of times when we think about blockers, one of the things that I work with leaders a lot on when they tell me what their mobile marketing campaign looks like for self-care is I find that they're buying into somebody else's definition of what it is. Like their brother or sisters, maybe they go get Manny Petties, or maybe they're watching ESPN at night or Sports Center, or maybe they're engaging socially with other people. And they do it just because, again, by proxy, okay, well, that looks like they seem happy, so let me do that. You have to define what self-care looks like for you. And it may be completely, maybe it's going and getting your journal, putting your feet in the ground and just listening to nature. And if, if, if your sister doesn't do something like that, that doesn't make it wrong. And that's the other piece. You, When we compare our self-care, that's also a block. Because when you answer the question, where and when do I feel most present for you, and it doesn't sound like what somebody in your house looks like, that's okay too. Healthy differences are a sign of progress. So we got to get out of this fact that just because I do it, you do it too. And here's the biggest blocker. I have seen some of the most gorgeous people in the world. I have seen them step out of some of the most amazing cars. I've been to some of the most beautiful places. But then when I talk to them, their outer care doesn't match their inner dialogue. And they're nasty to people. They don't tip well. They talk down about groups. So when your outer care does not match your inner dialogue, there is absolutely a block happening. Because what you think and what you say about yourself absolutely manifest out here. And when there's that misalignment, how can I trust you? How do I know you're authentic? If your self-care is misaligned from the inside, that's a deeper job and a deeper conversation than just being cute and pretty and having the best nails and the best hair. Because then you have to ask yourself, okay, what's happening inside that I need to shift? Yes. Oh. Guys, this is already going on like my top 15, like top, top chat. Seriously. Oh. There, Cause you know, there's, there's a list of, of, that I keep in mind of like, oh yeah, that was a really great chat. This one's like rocketing right to the top so <laughs> quickly, which I honestly probably should have known the second we started talking truly. Oh, um, all right. So let's talk about resources. Um, a lot yes. of people had wanted to know, you know, if there are exercises that you recommend resources mm -hmm. to help leaders increase self-awareness, ways we can mm -hmm. nurture our self-awareness. What do you say when people ask you for resources like this? They want to know like, you know, what else, where else can I go to learn more yes. or you know, whatever? Yes. So one of my favorite resources that I share all the time is called the Professional Quality of Life Measurement Tool. And it's absolutely free. You can just Google it. If you just type in ProQOL, it's going to come up and it comes up in different languages. So there's English and non-English translations. But let me tell you what I love about it. Not only that it's free 99, right, but also the questions, and it asks specific questions about happiness, about well-being, and about contentment. And it's not a lot of questions, like maybe 20, 25 questions. Those questions that leaders have used in our program have springboarded conversations with their team. So they have their team members do, to, do the assessment, and then they come with their responses for one-on-ones or group dynamics. You're going to get so much rich discussion because it's not who and what, it's how and why to help build and springboard workplace culture without the stress of saying, okay, well, we need to do self-care. So is everybody doing self-care? Great, everybody's doing self No, it's deeper questions. Like 50% of the people who answered this really don't have any contentment at work. Can we talk about what that sounds like? 20% of you don't have a wellness plan in writing. How can we assist you with that? What I love about the ProQOL too is that it has COVID pocket cards that you can print out I keep a couple on my desk 
that just helped me bring it back to ground zero and remember that we're still leading at the end of a pandemic going into a post-pandemic society and the quality of life that it just reminds you, sentence starters, conversation starters, email communication helps get you back to human beings, not human doings. And then there's a couple books that I think are really, really important, not just for leaders, but also when it comes to thinking about not the traditional book study of like, Meg, you read this chapter, Chriselle, you read this chapter, Jason, you read this chapter. As adults, read what resonates. Go to the chapters and the text and the articles that matter to you. And it's two books, The Body Keeps Score by Bissell Dan Verkolk, and it's wonderful because we have to be reminded everything we're experiencing, we might talk about it, we may go to a therapy, your body is still responding. So talking about stand-up desk, the 2020 rule, making sure that if you stare at the screen for 20 minutes, that you look away for 20 minutes and go look at something 20 feet away for 20 minutes, but also the book, What Happened to You? And this is a really good book on trauma, resilience, and healing by Bruce, Dr. Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey. But instead of saying, why well, are you okay? Maybe shifting that question to, how can I support you today? Because if you ask any human who's really involved, who's doing anything right to better themselves or their companies, if you ask them if they're okay, the answer unequivocally is going to be no. But asking the question, what happened? How can I support you? What are some things I'm doing that may be getting in the way of your success? Just shifting that conversation is going to open up safe psychological spaces for us to thrive as human beings in the workplace and at home and in our communities. Yes. Oh, Lord. I mean, this is absolutely wonderful. I'm loving, loving, loving all of this. We get, did get a question earlier. I want to make sure we touch on it here. Yeah. Um, this person had asked, how do we practice self-care after having conversations with colleagues that feel defeating? How can we mentally mm-hmm. regroup as leaders? And I think this is a good question, right? Cause we, you know, we talked early on about that, that kind of <sighs> perseverance mindset and how yes. if you're not doing the work in the background, just saying everything's going to be fine doesn't work for you. So if you were part, if you're a leader and you're trying to support your team, but you are finding yourself drained after speaking with, yeah. you know, with colleagues, what should you do to, to do that mental kind of reset or regroup for yourself? I think that's really important. And the other, the piece about this is to remember is like, where do you want to be not just busy, but productive in your self-care? So busy tells us, okay, I need to check the list off, which means I need to make sure Brandon and Lorencia and Christina are all doing the things. But what I'm missing with that in terms of productivity is that even if I only have Jason and Brandon who are doing 100%, we're 200% further toward our goals as an organization than if I take my energy away from the doers and focus on Christina who told me in our one-on-one that she doesn't believe in self-care, who told me in our one-on-one that she's not happy. I supported, I gave her resources. I did everything under the sun other than drive her to a therapist's office, right? But I need to remember that as as a leader, I wake up every single day with 24 hours of energy opportunities and support. Where I put that and how I move my organization forward absolutely has to be with that first third who are willing to do that second third who are just needing the support. Those third thirds, those ones who don't do, the ones who can't do after I tried to partner, after I tried to support, after we came into communion and consensus together, that maybe they are a culture cancer. And if I continue to spend time and energy here, they're going to infect the other ones that are trying to do. So maybe I need to take it to another tier. Maybe we need to have a different kind of conversation where I have an ally in the room, an HR advocate in the room. Why? Because it's too important. I started out and I said, it's about people, not places. You have to pour in and invest in the people who are doing, because that's going to make the shift for your customers, your clients, and your team overall. Yes. Loving this advice. Um, All right. We have less than a minute left. Um, what do you want to leave our audience with today? What should they absolutely take away? You know, do not leave without remembering this. Absolutely. The biggest piece is that I never end any talk with the end. I hope this is the beginning. 
whatever I said today that was a strategy or was something that was a task or something that you can activity that you can embed in, it starts today. Self-care is absolutely active. So whether you go and you log off and like Meg said, schedule the time to reflect, go to your calendar and start looking. Did you schedule yourself? Start talking with your team about the how and the why questions to spark that conversation or whether you simply log off and you say, you know what? There's just some areas I need to do some work and that is the first step. And also you can't do self-care wrong when you know you're in alignment with you. And that's what I hope that you take away from today. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mary, for spending time with us today. This has been a true joy. I, I love, love, love getting to host chats like this that really do recharge me for, for the rest of my work day. So thank you so much for spending time with our community, sharing your expertise. This has been truly wonderful. I cannot wait to see if we, you know, how soon we can have you back because this was so, so great. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you everyone for being here today. All right. If you um, have been here for today's event, uh, you know, whether you are new to Power to Fly or you are a frequent flyer with us, thank you so much for coming. We cannot wait to see you join us on another fabulous Power to Fly event. Um, we've got a couple more chats happening later today. Um, let's see, the one that I'm hosting next is about, let's see, uh, tips to score a job in cloud computing. So if you got, you, if that interests you, you can uh, hang out at uh, that chat starting at 3 p.m. Eastern. And we've got all kinds of great stuff happening also this week. You know, how collaboration at work can help you, how you can use video marketing to grow your business. Um, so I hope that we'll see many more of you on chats in the future. Have a great rest of your day and catch you later, y'all. Bye. Bye.